Hello, everybody. Hi, Sarah. Can you hear me? Hi, yes, we can hear you. Great. Thank you. I always like to check, so I'm not just <laughs> talking. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Statistics Solutions uh, webinar on Chapter 5, the discussion. Uh, we do have a co-host on, Sierra, and um, she's going to post, there you go, where you can find uh, copies of this webinar along with other uh, webinars that we give. Um, they're archived for a period of time on our website. Um, there's also some other links there for scheduling consultation if you want to do that. Um, some resources and any kind of non-content questions or questions about availability of the, the webinar or anything like that, you can direct, direct to Sierra. She'll be able to help you. Um, uh, moving forward, as far as um, questions about the content as we go along, um, feel free to write your questions in the question and answer box or the chat box. Um, as we go through so you don't forget them, um, but I won't get to them until the end. At the end, we'll have a, a question and answer session where I'll try to answer your questions. Okay, <clears throat> so let's get going. Um, if you've made it to the chapter five, congratulations. If you're not there yet and you're just kind of, um, you know, want to see what to expect uh, moving forward, uh, that's fine too. It's always, you know, good idea to, to have a, some kind of idea of what's, you know, uh, what's involved uh, in the future moving forward with your dissertation. Um, so just to pull back here for a minute <clears throat> to, to look at, um, you know, the bigger picture, you know, how the chapter five fits in with everything else. Excuse me a minute. Um, the chapter five, or sometimes, our, our model here uh, for the chapter the dissertation is based on the social sciences and a five chapter model where chapter one is the introduction, chapter two is the literature review, chapter three is the methodology, chapter four uh, presents your results, and chapter five is the discussion of the results. Um, and that's a pretty typical structure. Um, some schools may have more chapters, like a chapter six, and sometimes that is, you know, the discussion chapters is kind of split in two chapters, um, but the content is usually the same, even though it's, it's kind of spread out over two chapters. Um, so always get your school's template. Um, so you know exactly what your school is looking for, um, because that is what they will hold you to. You know that's what they will say. Well, you didn't you didn't have this section, or you didn't cover this. Um, get your school's template, follow it um, for all the chapters, and chapter five is no exception for the discussion, whatever ha chapter it happens to be. But yeah, so how this fits in is it's the end. You um, you have your results now, and now you need to talk about your results, and this is what this chapter focuses on. Okay. Um, Here's what we're going to be covering today, the introduction, interpretation of the findings, limitations, implications for practice, recommendations for further research summary. Now, again, these, these sections are pretty typical uh, across schools, but there, there may be some differences um, in how they're structured. There may be some differences in what they're called. Um, sometimes these sections are kind of split up in odd ways. Um, but this is the general, give you the general sense of it. Um, again, I can't emphasize enough, just follow your template, um, whatever kind of particularities and specifics it has. Okay, so for the introduction um, to the discussion chapter, it's like any other introduction, you just want to kind of reorient your reader, right? Oh, well, what's going on? Um, so it's always helpful to restate the purpose of your study. Um, and when you restate the purpose of your study, um, you're expected that when you restate the purpose statement or the purpose of your study, um, you're usually expected to um, relate it verbatim, meaning um, whatever your purpose statement is, just copy and paste that, essentially. Um, and it's really the only time you get a pass on copy and pasting anything in your research questions, too. Um, you, yeah, you can just use, use your purpose statement verbatim. The purpose of the study was, um, it's also a good idea to remind the reader 
of the importance of your study or the research problem. In other words, why was your study needed? Um, and then if you want to, you can preview contents of the chapter. Uh, so, the, you know, the introduction is, again, it's not much. It's just to kind of reorient the reader about what you did. Uh, the next section, usually called something like interpretation of the findings, or sometimes it's called discussion of the findings. Um, even though the, the chapter is called the discussion, this is actually kind of the discussion section of the discussion. This is really the heart of the chapter. Um, and everything that you're going to talk about later, like your uh, recommendations for practice, your recommendations for further research kind of stem from your interpretation of the findings. Um, so it's good to have sections or subsections in this section because um, you want to keep your reader um, in mind, you want to keep them focus on specifically what you're talking about, what hypothesis or what high, what research question or what theme, if it's qualitative, um, because there's a way that, you know, you start talking about things and you have findings uh, for different, you know, research questions or different themes that emerged. And um, it's easy to kind of get lost in your own findings and you're going to be bringing other research in. And if you're lost, then your reader is lost. So. Um, subsections really help to keep the section organized and the best way to do this if it's um, quantitative study usually um, make subsections based on your RQs or even your hypotheses um, so RQ1 you know here's here's what RQ1 asked um, summarize the findings right briefly here's what I found for RQ1 um, and then go into the discussion. What does the discussion consist of? What does that mean? Um, interpretation is a little misleading. It sounds like you get to come up with your own interpretation. Mm, not so much. I mean, it. So, so what it really means is you're relating your findings to the findings of previous literature, and then you can make conclusions based on that. Um, so. We're, and we'll talk about this for, for how to structure it for quant, uh, qualitative studies too, but just for sake of example now. Uh, so if your study is quantitative, you know, break your subsections down by RQ, RQ1, you know, asked, RQ1 asked, um, summarize your findings in really kind of plain spoken terms, right? This is not a statistical chapter. This the statistics chapter was chapter four, the results. Um, this is more of a plain spoken, um, I wouldn't say statistics free completely, but kind of statistics reduced. Um, so you don't need to kind of restate all those statistics about the findings, just kind of um, a good summary. Um, and then what what you want to do is um, note whether your start the discussion based on whether your findings um, support or do not support previous research that is found in chapter two, right? So this is the link between the discussion and the lit review. You've already kind of reviewed the literature in chapter two, in the literature review chapter. Um, so now it's time uh, to, to bring some of that in. So what are some of the major state, for, we're still on research question one, what are, what are some of the major findings um, of previous literature related to what you found in RQ1? Um, state, you know, whether your findings support those, whether they don't support those. Um, findings may be mixed in previous research. Um, so that would mean your findings would support some of them and not uh, others. Uh, but you, you, you want to set up a discussion uh, based on that, noting um, where your findings align with or don't align with previous literature. Um, then you can kind of make, um, you know, conclusions based on that. If your findings align with previous literature, well, then you can include whatever it is that you are looking at. Um, if your findings don't support previous literature, that's okay. Some people get um, a little... Uh, I don't know, a little agitated or a little worried if um, their findings don't aren't what they expected or if they don't support previous literature. And that's okay. I mean, this is an objective study, right? So your findings are what they are. You get what you get. Um, and they still have value and they still tell us something. Um, so if your findings don't align with previous research, 
um, that suggests inconclusiveness, right? And, and suggests probably the need for more research, which you can pick up on later in the recommendations for further research section. Um, also, if your findings don't support previous research, again, that's okay, but usually it's customary to um, provide an explanation, like why, you know, it's nothing you can prove, but you're going to try to explain why your finding may have been different than previous research. Um, and sometimes you just have to kind of, you know, sometimes it has something to do with your, your sample, your population may have been different. Um, you know, the setting, you know, different settings, you know, have different contextual uh, factors that may influence it. it may have something to do with the instrument you used. Um, or there, there may be an explanation in the literature that you can bring in, but you, you need to kind of provide some kind of explanation about why you find it may, may be different if they are. Um, and so these are the previous research, then, you know, you're bringing that in some of the major research from chapter two to support these, uh, these points. Um, also note if any of your findings are unexpected or novel or new, right? Because new new findings um, tell us something. They also give us provide avenues for further research. Um, okay, I think I've covered it pretty much now. For for qual uh, dissertations, um, it's really similar. It's just that instead of our cues, you break, um, you subsection uh, the section out by your themes, right? So if you, you conducted interviews, right, um, and did some kind of coding analysis, your, your results are probably taking the form of themes. Um, so for this section, subsection out by theme, here's the first theme I found, kind of summarize the theme. Um, you know, again, excuse me, I'll be right back. I'm sorry, right back. Um, yeah, so for qualitative, okay. uh, for qualitative studies, uh, very similar idea, but you're just, you're just subsectioning the section out with themes. Um, again, relate the theme. Theme number one was uh, summarize a little bit, and then again, go into whether what you found um, supports or doesn't support major literature, um, previous literature. Um, as far as bringing in participant quotes, um, when you're talking, you, you know, for a qualitative study in the chapter five, I would use participant quotes sparingly, um, meaning that you can use them, but, you know, use them sparingly to help you make points. Um, sometimes people are kind of, they don't realize or they don't kind of understand what should go in the chapter five. So they end up kind of copy and pasting a lot of stuff from the chapter four. Uh, don't do that. Um, your, your professors will see it and they'll, they'll flag it. Um, so again, that goes back to, you can bring some participant quotes in for a qual study to help make points, but I would do it um, only when it helps to uh, support a point you're trying to make and um, sparingly. Okay, um, so, so that's kind of the idea of that section. Um, and then just for each, if it's quant, for each RQ, just repeat, uh, you know, have a subsection repeating. And for each, if it's qual, for each theme, have, you know, just go on with your, your next themes. Um, okay, that's that. Um, and that gets us to limitations. Um, that, another suggestion is, um, of course, use your resources, like these webinars, um, anything online, anything the school has, the writing center, um, use your resources. But a great resource too is, and if you haven't been doing this already, you probably, you, you may have, um, obtain an example or, 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 a, or an approved dissertation from your school kind of in your area. Um, you can get those through ProQuest. 
um, ProQuest, ProQuest publishes uh, dissertations, or maybe even your chair, ask your chair if they have one or two um, that they'd like you to kind of look at as, as an example. Because some of these sections, um, you know, you've never written a dissertation before. It's understandable. You're not really sure what to do. Uh, you read the guidelines, you, you know, you think you understand it, and it, it kind of makes sense until you sit down to write it. And um, suddenly, you know, the blank page is a little more intimidating than you thought. So this is where examples help. You can see how people have um, handled these sections in the past. Okay, so for limitations, um, you may have had a section uh, like this in chapter one and or in chapter three. Um, but of course, those were in your proposal. And at that point, you were kind of forecasting or projecting what might be potential limitations. Um, so now's the time to talk about limitations that actually occurred in your study, right? Any shortcomings, any weaknesses um, that may have affected your results, right? So um, it's not a long section, but um, usually there are some kind of limitations. Um, like major limitations for um, quantitative studies, uh, like small sample size, right? Because that will kind of decrease um, the statistical certainty of your results if you have small sample size or it's underpowered. So that's something you have to check. Sometimes um, if you can't get the sample that you wanted, you have to use like a proxy sample, right? A different one um, that could, you know, influence your results. Um, things like social desirability bias, you know, there's different kinds of bias um, and sensitive, like studies that involve kind of sensitive topics, um, sexuality sometimes, um, you know, maybe mental health, um, you know, sometimes even though responses are anonymous, they're confidential. Sometimes people will answer in ways that put them in a good light rather than honestly. Um, so sometimes something that, that's called social desirability bias, um, people want to answer in ways that are socially desirable rather than truthfully. So sometimes those certain kinds of bias can be um, limitations. So this is the place you want to kind of get any of those out. Just you know, say that, um, you know, all studies have limitations and this particular study had, you know, these limitations, whatever they were. Um, and just talk a little bit about those and what they are and how they might have affected your results. Um, you should also discuss the generalizability of your results to the larger sample population. So that means taking the information from your sample, right? Can, can it be transferred? Can it be generalized to the larger population, the larger sample population? Usually with um, quantitative studies, if you have a, an adequate sample size, usually your generalizability should be pretty good. There's things that help generalizability and things that kind of decrease it, things like random samples, um, because random samples are more likely to get a kind of a representative uh, sample um, that increases your generalizability, um, different kind of sampling procedures like convenient sampling, um, where you just, um, you have folks because you know them or it's convenient to have them in, in your study that may kind of decrease your generalizability. Qualitative studies um, for limitations, um, you know, researcher bias, can sometimes be a limitation if, if it's something you're, you you care about and you're really close to. Um, and there are ways to kind of guard against um, researcher bias. Um, and you have to check those out. I think one that's called bracketing, um, where you kind of, you know, you write down and you bracket your own preconceived notions about the topic and set those aside. Um, member checking, I think, is another one um, where you have the... Um, the people you interviewed, you have them look back over um, after you've, you know, collected the data from them uh, to see, to make sure what they said is kind of accurate. <clears throat> um, so if, if any of those things, if you're doing a qual study may have been a potential limitation, you want to note them and you also want to note how uh, you addressed it. Um, and also for generalizability for qualitative studies, um, 
this is worth saying um, because qualitative studies typically involve interviews. I mean, they can involve other data sources, but interviews is pretty common. Um, interviews are long, they're in depth, um, and that's what they're designed for. They're designed to get you know, in-depth information from people. So uh, your sample size has to be small, usually 10, 12, 15 people. Um, and that's by design because with larger sample sizes uh, in quantitative studies, you can interview a hundred people, uh, right? So qualitative studies are have a small sample size because they're designed to get in-depth, rich, deep information that quantitative studies can't. Therefore, um, the results of your qualitative study will not generalize. They will not generalize um, because of the small sample size, but it, they're not designed to. So, but it's worth, it's worth noting that. Um, but what they can do is provide in-depth insight on the topic, right? Um, but again, it's, it's not a matter of generalization, like with qu quantitative studies. Okay, uh, implications for practice. Um, this is an important section because um, it, it doesn't have to be long, but um, I find that people kind of like the implications for practice, the, the recommendations for further resource, uh, research, um, people kind of fall down in these sections. Um, like they're not sure what to do. And this is where you have to kind of just go to your findings, right? Just, just pull them out, you know, just put them in another document if you can while you're writing it. Um, so you can, you know, refer to it as, as you're writing this section. Um, how does what you found um, relate to practice? How does it relate to what people actually do in your field, right? At the level of practice. Um, what do your findings mean for professionals in the field? Right, so if it's an education study, um, for example, um, your findings may have implications or may inform what teachers do, right? Uh, it may inform what administrators do. It, you know, if, it, if it's a, something on parents, it may inform uh, you know, parents, how parents kind of interact with their, their children or how they um, support them in their homework or something like that. Um, so, you want to get really kind of specific and detailed about how what you found um, can inform practice. And you can get kind of nuts and bolts here where, um, you know, what does that mean? How might this information be distributed, you know, or disseminated to the involved people? If it's teachers, maybe it's through professional development, maybe it's through seminars or, um, you know, uh, workshops or something. So you can get kind of, you know, hands on nuts and bolts with this. It's, it's you know, what, what does your um, findings, how can it inform people um, at the practice level? Okay, and another section, recommendations for further research. It's just like it sounds, what are you gonna recommend um, for further research for the researchers moving forward, right? Now, this is not a general kind of recommendation for further research, right? It's based specifically on what you found. And sometimes it can be based on limitations of your study as well. But um, so they have a specific connection to your findings. They're not just general, you know, they're just, hey, I think it would be a great idea to um, do some more research on, on whatever, um, but it has nothing to do with your findings. No, it needs to be tied in with what you found. And again, sometimes on limitations. Um, so, some kind of typical avenues, ways to go here is um, if your findings don't support previous research, right? Um, that suggests inconclusiveness. So that's kind of an automatic right there, um, you know, to recommend more research on the topic to 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 get some more conclusive evidence, right? Um, any findings that are unexpected or novel or new. Um, that can um, be the basis for recommending further exploration, right? Because if something's new, it's, it's just come out, uh, you found um, definitely it would require more uh, research. Um, you can also recommend different types of studies um, and different types of designs to obtain um, different kinds of information. So, um, 
you know, like if you, but if you recommend a different kind of study, I'll also talk about what it would add. So like, say you recommended, you want, um, you want to recommend more comprehensive kind of understanding of a topic where well, you could recommend like a case study, right? Um, because a case study involves multiple data sources. So that gives you a kind of a more comprehensive understanding of the topic, just rather than approaching it, um, you know, quantitatively or just uh, qualitatively. Um, longitudinal study, if you wanted to recommend that something be you know, evaluated over time uh, because it's a dynamic, some kind of dynamic process uh, or topic. Um, you could recommend longitudinal studies, right, with multiple data collection points over time. Um, but whatever you recommend, I also have a few words about, you know, don't just recommend it and don't say why you're recommending it or what it's going to tell us right so so part of your recommendation should come along with um, if you recommend something there should be a reason for it and say a little bit about what kind of information it would yield that could be helpful um, recommendations can also be based on limitations um, that means say you did you ran a um, conducted a quantitative study the sample size was low, right? So it, it, your study was underpowered. So your your results are have to be interpreted interpreted with that limitation in mind. Um, you just recommend that researchers replicate the study in the future and address that, and make sure that limitation is addressed. So um, you can you know base some recommendations on on limitations. Um, the idea is that just replicate the study and address the limitation. Okay. And then with the summary, um, check your school's template. Sometimes schools just let you end with recommendations for, for the research. Sometimes they want to study. Schools are different. Again, just see what your school wants. Um, so the idea is recap major points from the chapter. And since this is the summary, not only of the chapter, but of the entire study, the dissertation, uh, you want to leave your reader with a take home message. And what that is, is the most important aspects of your study that you want the reader to remember, right? Um, to leave them with a strong kind of positive, um, you know, take home message about what you found, why your study was important. Okay, I wanna go back. Um, Interpretation, interpretation of the findings. Um, now, sometimes, again, schools are different. Um, the theoretical framework that you use for your study, or if it's qualitative, the conceptual framework, um, how does this fit in in the discussion section? Again, this is a thing where you have to you have to check your template, see what it says. Sometimes um, you can kind of secrete discussions of the theory in this interpretation of the finding section. You know, if um, if the theory helps you interpret uh, some of these findings from your, your research questions or your themes, um, I would, you know, just include it in there. Sometimes um, schools will have a section called implications for research which gets a little confusing because you already have recommendations for further research. Implications for research is a little different. It means, you know, based on what you found, what does that mean for research moving forward? Or it can mean, what does it mean for theory, right? Um, sometimes you can just call it implications for theory um, or links to theory, right? Um, so if it's implications for research and or theory, you know, the idea is, what does your what is your study yielded and what are the implications for kind of moving forward with research maybe it it shows researchers that we have to approach the topic in a different way or we need to use a new theory or we need to modify a, a new theory but so it's like implications for practice but not at the level of practice but at the level of research um, and this is a, a place too if, if you have that section where you can talk about your theoretical framework you can talk about your theory um, and how what you found links to your theory Right. So does it support your does your support your theory? Does your th theory help um, explain the findings? 
um, and they want to see how it contributes to the theory. So does it contribute to our understanding of the theory? Um, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it adds, yeah, this theory works for explaining this phenomenon in this certain population. Um, so sometimes they do, uh, the schools do want some discussion of the theory, but it's, it's kind of um, case by case basis, I would say. You know, some schools do, some schools don't. Uh, so, sometimes they want a separate section for it. Sometimes you can just kind of include it in the interpretation of the finding section. So again, it's kind of um, where you have to just look at your template and see what it's looking for. All right. Um, and this is who we are and what we offer and some contact information. I know you have some contact information too in the chat box. Um, you know, what we do, we help with statistics, we help with editing, we help with, um, you know, content development. In other words, you know, helping you to develop the, um, the document to the point where you can submit it and help you uh, get, uh, address the feedback once you do submit. Um, and you can feel free to make a, um, an appointment to consult if you think this is something um, that you'd be interested in. Of course, there's no obligation. You just get information if um, this might be right for you. All right. Thank you, Sierra. Um, any questions at this point about the chapter five? I know that's kind of a lot of information. Um, so everybody's good with the chapter five? What is the preferred length of chapter five? That's a good question. Um, if there is a, a length requirement, uh, sometimes there, there is, sometimes there's not. Again, your, your school's template should have it if there is. Um, ballpark figure though, um, just in my experience, anywhere from 10 to 20 pages. So it's not a long chapter. I would say the sweet spot is usually 12 to 15. Um, and it depends sometimes, um, quant, uh, studies are a little shorter, you know, 10, 12 pages, qual studies tend to be a little longer the chapter because of the themes tend to run a little longer um and you might have you know six themes and you have to discuss discuss each one um that's what it is i'd say 12 to 15 pages on average as low as 10 sometimes as high as 20. okay can the discussion be about the findings with relevant and contrast studies as well um yeah um that's that's part of the um, that's oops, that's part of the um, interpretation of the finding section, right? Yeah, mark this as answering it. Okay. One. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's where you would bring the information in here, uh, the inter interpretation of the finding section, um, where you relate your findings to um, past relevant literature, right? Past relevant research from your chapter two. Um, now, do you need to bring in new information to the chapter five? Usually not. Um, usually you just, they just want you to stick what's already in the chapter two. Um, Sometimes chairs will want you to do a quick little um, literature search to see if anything has come out while you were conducting your study. Usually, nothing has come out. Usually, because it's you know it's a couple of years, research takes a little while to come out. Um, sometimes, if if something new has come out, it's usually not much. Um, sometimes they want you to bring that research in, um, but usually that's a chair preference. Um, usually it's just material that should be already in your um, chapter two. And yeah, you do want to see uh, whether your research aligns with that previous research or does not align with that previous research. So, yeah.
that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay. Everybody's good with the five. And just remember, when you're at the five, it's 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 great because you're near the end. But um, you know, there's still some there's still some steps in the process, right? There's still um, have to usually go through some kind of university review after your chair and committee looks at it. Um, it usually has to go through form and style where they look at the, the, the kind of the formatting specifically. Um, so there's still a few steps, but it is very, it's a very um, big milestone to get, get to the five. All right, so if there's no other questions, um, I'm gonna let everybody go. Uh, thank you uh, for coming and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.